The late Chief Justice William Rehnquist was nominated by President Richard Nixon to serve as an Associate Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. In their book, The U.S. Supreme Court and New Federalism, Christopher Banks and John Blakeman argue that this nomination may have been due in part to the fact that Rehnquist, as a young law clerk for Justice Robert Jackson, proved to be an ardent critic of the Warren Court's judicial activism. It is likely that this may have made Rehnquist an attractive choice for conservatives and may have very well meshed with Nixon's Southern strategy of attacking the Warren Court's liberal judicial politics. When Rehnquist was elevated to the position of Chief Justice in 1986, he moved the court in a direction that has been regarded as the new federalism by political scientists and legal scholars. The new federalism, according to Banks and Blakeman, refers to the manner by which the Rehnquist court sought to place aggressive and affirmative constitutional limits on the federal government while at the same time protecting the sovereignty of state governments. Many scholars agree that even though Chief Justice Warren Burger was nominated by Republican President Richard Nixon, he and his fellow justices did not dramatically reverse many of the liberal Warren Court's precedents. In fact, if anything, the Burger Court erred on the side of nationalizing power. Later, when Ronald Reagan would become president, he would nominate several justices to the Supreme Court who would later work to reverse this trend. In his inaugural address, Reagan stated that he wanted to return power back to the states. Because Reagan sought to, the, to shift the balance of decision-making towards states, cities, and localities, his judicial nominees to the Supreme Court tended to be committed to returning power back to the states. Besides elevating William Rehnquist to the position of Chief Justice, Reagan also nominated Sandra Day O'Connor, who would become the first female Supreme Court Justice. And Reagan nominated Antonin Scalia to the bench, who would become a staunch ally of his conservative agenda. Reagan also nominated Justice Anthony Kennedy to the court, and while he has, been, he has at times demonstrated some liberal leanings in the past, Kennedy has nevertheless proven to be an ally to the new federalism movement. One of the major trends of the Rehnquist Court is that it had a very high tendency to overturn federal laws. In their book, Banks and Blankman point to the 1995 case, United States v. Lopez, a five to four decision where the court nullified the Federal Gun Free School Zones Act because it took over state law that traditionally regulated crime policy. To justify this decision, the court reasoned that gun possession near local public schools is a non economic activity and therefore it lacks a substantial effect on interstate commerce which is a key issue that has historically been used to determine whether or not Congress is properly exercising its power. It is interesting to see that the Rehnquist Court would later find the Religious Freedom Restoration Act to be unconstitutional in the 1993 case, City of Bernie versus Flores. What we would see later, though, is Congress was extremely adamant in having this law, and they would later go on to pass another version of this, which Congress would not, excuse me, which the court would not overturn. The Rehnquist Court also extended the 11th Amendment immunity, so states would be protected from being sued in federal courts, and this is perceived by many scholars as having perhaps the greatest impact on constitutional federalism. While the Rehnquist Court in many respects changed the law by frequently invalidating federal statutes, it nevertheless was not uncommon for this court to be rife with five to four decisions. During the late 1990s and well into the first decade of the new millennium, Justice Stevens, Justice Ginsburg, and Justice Breyer, and Justice Souter 
tended to voice their disagreements with the new federalism agenda of the Rehnquist Court. Also, it is worth pointing out even justices who are regarded as being proponents of states' rights will not always necessarily go out of their way to invalidate a federal law. For example, if you look at the chart on page 105 of Banks and Blakeman's book, you will see that the authors make what I think is a very interesting observation. Take a look at the voting patterns of Justice Scalia, Justice Kennedy, Justice Thomas, and former Justice O'Connor. All of these justices, if you look at the chart, tended to cast more votes that the authors regard as being pro-federal government. I suppose, however, that they are still regarded as being proponents of states' rights because when they did vote in favor of states' rights, they did so perhaps in the cases that counted the most. Of all the justices on the Rehnquist court, only Rehnquist was consistently and overwhelmingly the most likely of all justices to side with the states. This is a point that is worth noting, and it shows that the Rehnquist court did not always speak with one unified conservative voice, but nevertheless the court did have strong leanings toward state authority. Between 1986 to 2005, the Rehnquist court also made some fairly interesting rulings that affected the day-to-day -day operations of prisons. One aspect of the Rehnquist court's decision-making pattern in corrections law is particularly striking. When the court was most divided, the justices voted consistently according to their position on a liberalism-conservatism perspective. And while it is true that the Rehnquist court produced a mix of both liberal and conservative outcomes in corrections cases, two-thirds of the court's decisions rejected prisoners' claims and favored the correctional institution's interests. Given this, I think it is fair to say that correctional administrators were for the most part very pleased with the key rulings of the Rehnquist court, at least those related to prisons between 1986 to 2005. Many court observers have labeled Justice Clarence Thomas as being the true revolutionary on matters related to federalism. In regard to the issue of religion, Banks and Blakeman point out that Justice Thomas's federalism interpretation of church-state relations insulates state institutions against federal law and regulation in all matters of religious policymaking. Scholars of the Supreme Court who have analyzed the voting patterns and written opinions of Justice Thomas over the years have argued that Thomas essentially believes that the First Amendment was aimed at preventing federal government interference in state establishments of religion, not to erect a wall separating church and state. Generally, it is agreed upon that Thomas supports allowing religious groups more participation in public life. Thomas has written that he supports incorporation of the Free Exercise Clause, which he says clearly protects an individual right. Some scholars have argued that Justice Thomas believes that any law which would violate the Establishment Clause, a phrase which has been regarded as being uh, a wall of separation between church and state, might conceivably violate one's ability to freely exercise his or her religion. Now Banks and Blakeman do not make this point in their book, but I think it's an observation that may be worthy of further investigation and further exploration. Perhaps this could even be the subject of someone's next mini-paper. In any case, Justice Thomas's interpretation of the Establishment Clause will most likely not evolve to become an integral part of the Supreme Court's federal revolution. The Roberts Court has yet to develop its own distinctive approach to religious liberty, but it seems as though it will continue in the direction of the Rehnquist Court. Of course, it may still be too early to tell. As Banks and Blakeman point out, the Roberts Court has accepted few religious liberty cases for full review. So, really, the question remains open as to how exactly the Roberts Court will view any further attempts to bring federalism into church-state constitutional law.